Hello, and welcome back to another episode of Beyond the To-Do List. I'm your host, Eric Fisher, and this is the show where I talk to the people behind the productivity. This week, I'm excited to share with you a conversation I had with Mo Carrick. She's the author of the recent book, Brave Space Workplace, Making Your Company Fit for Human Life. And in this conversation, we talk about what can make a workplace unfit for human life, first off. We identify the problem. We spend some time there talking about a lot of the reasons why you can be miserable at work. And then we flip it and start to talk about what you can do about it as an employee, but also what you can do about it as a leader in an organization. How you can go from being miserable to thriving in that organization so that there is a win-win happening for both employees and employers. So whatever place you take in that spectrum, and to be honest, even if you're not in an organization that is large, even if it's small, even if it's just you, you still have a workplace and you can still be creating an ecosystem of one that is unfit for you. So learn how to overcome that and thrive in your workplace, whatever shape that takes in this conversation with Mo Carrick. Well, this week, it is my privilege to welcome to the show Mo Carrick. Mo, welcome to the show. Thanks, Eric. Super happy to be here. So I, you know what, I kind of regret not being able to talk to you about your previous book, Fit Matters, but I think it kind of fits in with what we'll talk about in this conversation. The new book is called Brave Space Workplace, which I love how that rhymes, by the way. Um, <laughs> and, it, and the subtitle is Making Your Company Fit for Human Life. I did not realize that our companies weren't fit for human life. <laughs> it's like a it's like a post apocalyptic uh, Armageddon wasteland that we work in is what that right. the picture it of, sort right? of feels that way sometimes, doesn't it? Yeah. So I, in the first book, you know, Fit Matters, uh, aware of the book, obviously, Fit Matters, mm-hmm. How to Love Your Job. It focused more on the job seeker. This book focuses more on the leadership in the culture, in the environment, in the in the workplace, and what they can do to make sure that their employees are thriving. But that said, I think there's a lot that employees will also get out of this book as well. Mm, thanks. That's definitely one of my hopes, you know, is that anybody could actually pick it up and find some value in their work situation, whether they're working as an individual contributor, whether they're a sole entrepreneur, or whether they're working in a, you know, a small, medium or mega company. Um, That's the idea. But yeah, as I was going through the book, I could see that there was a lot of reminders, not only for employers, but employees Mm -hmm. as to how they could get on the same page uh, and care for each other. Because again, the leadership inside of an organization should also be striving for making the company fit for human life because they also, too, are a human in that environment, right? Right, right. Absolutely. Absolutely. They have the same needs and the same drives and the same complexities that that the employees are or, or have, I should say. Yeah. So if you're making the statement that most workplaces are unfit for humans. A lot of people are going to say, okay, well, then what makes a workplace toxic and unfit for humans to to live and work in? Um, I look at this a lot, you know, I mean, obviously in prepping for the book, but also in my 30 plus years consulting. And there's so much data out there. I'm sure you've seen it, Eric, you know, whether it's Gallup research or um, or other, you know, Deloitte's research or other other research that tells us that, you know what, employees aren't thriving. They're not engaged. The numbers are kind of abysmal um, for how satisfied people are. Um, There's a lot of demoralization. Jeffrey Pfeffer, who I quote um, in the book, a Stanford researcher published a book in 2018 called Dying for a Paycheck. And he actually talks about the physical health implications of, of the workplace on us as a society and the costs you know, of that. So I think there's a ton of evidence that even though I think we've known for a long time what it takes to create a workplace where people can really um, can really bring their best to work every day, we still in many cases aren't able to do it. We're not able to kind of crack that nut. Um, and it results in uh, employees and, and leaders, you know, people at every level who go to work and end up feeling demoralized, disenfranchised, unconnected, bored, 
um, underutilized. And so then they end up bringing a fraction of themselves to work every day. And the rest of their greatness is kind of held in the closet or applied to their uh, avocation, you know, um, pursuits. And I think we can do better than that. Well, and you mentioned bringing a fraction of themselves to work or to bear on their work even, which is interesting to me that you phrase it that way because people don't actually think about how much time they're spending at work. Or if they do, they feel like I'm always at work. But either way, either way that they're looking at it, it's a huge percentage of their weekly and even annual time that they're in their workplace, especially with the blurred boundaries of digital technology that allows us to work from anywhere at any time. Totally. You're, you're spot on. I think that, you know, the, and I talk about this in, in the chapter to, titled toxic is bad. Um, I talk about, you know, that 24 um, seven access, the digital age and, and how hard it is for us to have boundaries um, between our work and our lives. And, and some, in some cases people prefer it that way. They like the um, kind of rolling in the moment, working virtually, kind of having work and life be really intertwined. And, um, and there's a lot that's good about that. And it, it makes it, um, uh, hard for us to sort of have um, a protected space that says, oh, this is work. And then this is, you know, the rest of me. So it all gets mixed up together in terms of our identity. And I think because of how much time we spend at work, especially anyone who's working full time or, or, you know, many people today are working multiple jobs, they're spending more time at work than they are anything else. And, and they're with their colleagues at work more often than they are with anyone else in their family um, and, or their friends. And so that, that, that puts a lot of pressure on saying, you know, is it, is it really working for me? You know, um, is it a place that's bringing out my, my greatness so that I have a, a good and meaningful life? I know I struggle constantly because I'm using digital technology to do my work and working from home that there's this struggle to shut off work to Mm -hmm. not constantly feel like I'm either on the job or on call, you know, in the same way that like a doctor, you know, certain doctors at certain times have like quote their pager back in the day, you know, Oh, the office beeped me. Remember the the phrase that was always (laughs) in TV. So Right. <laughs> no, it's true. We 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 tend it's it's very intrusive, isn't it? Right. We've got our our phones and and our devices. You know, one of the things I talk about in the book. It's interesting. Is when I early in my career, I worked as an internal consultant for what was then Macaw Cellular, which later became Cellular One. It was back in the days of analog cellular technology, and Craig Macaw was the very inspired and and uh, big vision uh, leader of of the company. And when I was just first hired, right out of gra- graduate school, um, he gave a welcome you know, welcome to Macaw speech to all 100 of us new employees and stuff. And he talked about that he had this vision that someday, and he actually said, someday we'll have a device implanted in our head. And that device will allow us to do everything, banking, um, schedule appointments, answer phone calls, send email, which was really new then. This was in 1989. Um, And we were like, wow, he's gone off his rocker a little bit. Like, you know, that's not going to be the case because we still had landline phones and we had the cell phones were, you know, the size of a bunch of celery. Um, and, and so we didn't, I, I didn't, I can remember thinking that I think he's going a little far out there, you know, but now it's true. We have these devices, we carry them in our hands. They allow us to do everything and to be mobile um, with, with things, which makes that work boundary um, very, very thin. And I think the other erosion that happens, um, and I speak about this a little bit in the book, and I don't know about you, Eric, but for me, I really noticed that and I hear this from leaders, especially all the time. We don't have enough time to think yes. because we've got the, the technology allows this constant intrusion. It's all on our screens. It's on our devices. It's, you know, it, we're, we're getting pinged, uh, whether it's I am or Slack or the cell phone or the email, there's something always intruding. And so we don't end up with this capacity for deep work. Um, for, you know, tackling um, creative or innovative or just hard thinking kinds of planning, because that work takes a little while to get into, you know, we have to have sort of a, a space to, to do that work. And I think unless we proactively turn all that uh, connectivity off, it's pretty hard sometimes for us to do that really good thinking. Yeah, well, and, and I know people will probably get sick of me mentioning this, but it's, it really makes me think of Parkinson's law, which basically states that work expands to fill the time allotted for it. And Mm -hmm. what we've been basically talking here is this technology that has, you know, gradually, but then not so gradually, like slowly it was a tidal wave and then it was a tsunami that has kind of eroded our 
it's not it eroded our ability. It's eroded mm-hmm. our intentionality. We've not mm-hmm. we just have, we've accepted a status quo where technology dictates that those lines got blurred when that's not necessarily what has to happen. It's just what we've accepted as the truth. Um, I always go back to my, my friend, uh, his father is about the same age as mine and has lived longer than my friend and I have, you know, he's a generation ahead of us. And it was funny to see how he, when suddenly he didn't have his phone, and used to be old school and can use a map and all of that freaked out when he didn't have his phone and was trying to figure out where to go. My, my friend told me this hilarious story about all of that. And I touch on it right there just to say that like we get so quickly accommodated to new status quos. Yeah, we do. I think especially in that, in that, in that place around um, the influence that technology has. And of course, I mean, it goes beyond that in terms, in terms of the workplace um, with, when you think about how jobs are being changed by the presence of technology in the work itself. And I, I also address that in the book um, in the chapter that's titled AI machines and robots. Oh my, you know, because I think we're being impacted by the intrusion of technology in many ways. Um, and, and that's one of them. And it's certainly one that I think the workforce has fear um, about in terms of, you know, will my job re- be replaced? Will I still be relevant um, in a, in a technology oriented way? What do you think we should do when there's worry, when there's concern about, again, the shifting, uh, I'll go back to that tidal wave metaphor of technology as it continues to play a much bigger, you know, role and can, you know, is a constant connective piece. What kind of questions do we need be, need to be asking in the workplace when it comes to machines and AI and humans? Yeah, it's uh, that's such a good question and and I and I I think there's a couple of different things that we need to wonder and that we need to to poke at. Um, and, and I've looked at this a lot because, um, I, you know, I started, I started my career. Well, I didn't start my career in technology, but I ended up working in, in it, um, early in my career. And so I feel like I've had exposure to, you know, the wonderful things that technology does for us. And, and, um, and so we, it's our love of the improvements technology has had on the quality of work and, and the speed of, of some of the work that automation and big data has allowed us to do that, that it makes us so kind of attached to it now. I think we need to be asking ourselves, what is it that technology does that, that it does better than us people, you know, and, um, and how do we design that technology and then leverage that technology to, to do those things. And, you know, we know what some of those are, right? Crunching big data, um, automating tasks that require precision that, um, that a human would fatigue or get a workplace injury doing over and over and over again, you know, machine can do that without, you know, costs and without strain. Um, I think though that the, that leads us then if we ask what do, what does technology, what do machines do that humans, you know, don't do as effectively or as efficiently, then I think we have to ask the next more robust question, which is what is it that is uniquely human? And what's the work that we human beings can do that technology, as far as we can see, cannot do? And I think that represents a big change in um, in how we view sort of society as a whole, because what, you know, the biggest area that technology can't crack yet are the human dimensions of connection. So to my knowledge, every and every bit of research I've looked at says machines can't really be trained right now to do empathy. They can't do human connection. Um, so the jobs that require those uniquely human characteristics of love, of connection, of empathy, like customer service and education and um, many fields in, in medical, uh, in the medical arena, leadership, uh, as an example, the algorithms to get to the nuance of human complexity um, in that space are are just not even fully defined yet. So I think that's, you know, one of my hopes is that we'll be able to actually improve the way we value uh, many of those jobs as being uniquely human and then training and supporting people to grow and elevate those skills that are that are uniquely human so that the, the technology can put in the category that that it does, you know, what it what it does best to help us not have to do those jobs um, that are rote or boring or hurt us. You know, let's let technology do that. 
Um, but let's let's really get all over the stuff that technology can't do. Um, and, you know, we, we can't we everybody's predicting. I mean, we know that technology is going to eliminate jobs. It's already happened. It will continue to happen. But as a society, that doesn't mean that we get to just say, oh, wring our hands. Isn't that a bummer? I think we have to look at that and say, all right, what does that mean for society then? Because people need to work for our entire economic system, as well as for the meaning that comes with contributing to something. We have to have work be part of that. So if machines are eliminating jobs, okay, then what's our plan for the human beings who need to work? What are we going to do to give them that meaning and that contribution and, and also that, um, that, need, that ability to meet their needs, their, their financial needs? Yeah. When it comes to uh, technology and the interaction between human and all of that, I keep I always go back to this metaphor of Tony Stark and Iron Man. Uh, right. I've been using that for a while now since the movies came out you know, 10 years ago. And what's funny is, uh, you, as you were speaking, it made me think of this moment in, uh, I think it's the first Avengers movie where Captain America turns to, uh, Tony Stark and he says, uh, something along the lines of you're, you're a big man in a suit of armor, but if you take that off, what are you? And right back at him, Tony Stark's like a genius billionaire playboy philanthropist, which are all (laughs) great things for the most part. And it's like, he's still uniquely him, whether he's got the technology or or not. And it's, mm-hmm. it's about that symbiosis between the tool and the person that's using the tool. Well, yeah, yeah, you're right. And I think we're also learning so much right now as we look at the way, particularly in AI, but in, but in other areas of technology innovation as well, we're, we've become really aware that the machines we're designing have some of the same flaws that we have as human beings. For example, you know, we're programming bias right into our machines. We we can't help but do that because of how we're wired as humans. So, you know, that I think helps us to remember that um, that, that, that the machines too are created by the people behind them. And we, mm-hmm. we have the ability to, to be more thoughtful perhaps and more proactive about how we integrate, you know, cause for me, it's going to be about the integration of technology into our, our communities, not the, um, not the replacement of our communities with technology. I think we've been talking about this a bit when it comes to the technology and even, you know, the blurring of the lines. I I think I mentioned the word intentionality and that's what it Mm kind of seems like. I know you brought up, uh, I believe, you know, planning and or uh, you were in essence bringing up intentionality. I want to get back to this this problem of a a workplace being toxic and what all that means. But then we can flip it and go back to, okay, how do we turn it into a brave space, as you call it? Mm -hmm. Yeah. One of the threads between the two books, you mentioned my first book with my co-author, Cammie Dunaway, Fit Matters, How to Love Your Job. And what what Cammie and I were really trying to poke at is we wanted to understand and our research led us to identifying um, the the dimensions of work fit that activate the best that we as human beings have to offer. So how do I, particularly for job seekers, as you said, how do I from the outside look for the place where I'm going to be really well fit, not where I fit in, but where I'm going to actually um, have my highest and best use be actualized. And I expanded on that work with Brave Space and one of the places that it landed me, and this, this does tie into the question of what is it that makes a workplace toxic, um, is that I've identified seven things that people need from work. And these are temporally sensitive, Eric, right? I mean, they change over time. And I think that we've seen quite a sea change in the last 50 years of, um, of business and of organizational uh, advancement around what the human beings that are entering the workforce are needing from work. Um, and it's when we don't have those needs met that the workplace begin, begins to get toxic. Uh, so just swiftly, just to sort of bring them into the conversation, the seven things are, we talked about some of them, right? The first one is to meet our basic requirements, Mm -hmm. which is just making enough money or non-cash compensation to provide the basics, food, shelter, safety, security. That's kind of a no brainer. We all know that that's out there in our contract with our employer, whatever, or, you know, with our work that we do. Well, Um, and and I want to pause right there and say, yeah, most of the time and, and for a long time, that has been it right there. Yes. Like the paycheck and and nothing right. else. And no. I think that's the biggest shift that I've experienced at least over the course of the past 
ugh, I can't even guess now, 20 plus years in the quote work f- space has been this uh, adding in of these other six things. So sorry, I wanted to interrupt you there and just say, like, we've come a long way in terms of what we expect from from our employers and our workspaces. Yes, yes, I think you're spot on. And we really see a sea change with the entering workforce, you know, the the, the millennials and the generation uh, Z's, you know, right behind them, they're, they're looking at the landscape, and they're looking for things from their employees that are completely different than what I did as a as a young boomer, you know, and that emphasis on that first need from work meeting our basic requirements, actually, it's actually fallen way down in the priority scale for uh, for people entering the workforce today, because they've, you know, we've gone through the great recession. Session. We've seen um, dynamic sea change in the, the the loyalty between employer and employee, and and people are saying, well, yes, I do need to meet my basic needs, but if I'm paid fairly, um, I, I that actually isn't the most important thing that's keeping me at this job. And I think this is one of the first times in history when that's really very profoundly the case. And we see young people, for example, foregoing things that has sort of been de facto, especially here in the U.S., like that that the gold star will be owning a home or even owning a, ha- a car. You know, in Europe, as an example, people aren't that motivated to own a home because most people don't own a home. Most people are renting because the cost of home ownership and certainly in the cities in Europe is, is uh, just out of most people's reach. So they don't even have that mindset. And I think we're seeing a shift in our country around people saying, you know, yeah, sure, maybe be nice to own a home, but that's not the end all be all. Like, whereas for me, when I entered the workforce in the 80s, it was, it was like, oh yeah, you get a job so that you can make enough money so that you can get these things that our society values. And I think we're seeing a whole, a wholesale change around what qualifies as a basic requirement. Um, The other items are, the second one is to contribute which is I define as being able to do something that matters to someone. And sometimes people interpret that as that I'm saying, oh, everybody wants to work for a social or environmentally minded organization. And that's not that's not what I mean. What I mean is that we want to know what is it that what we're how is it that what we're doing matters to someone. And that's, you know, similar to the first one, food, shelter, safety, security. These are on Maslow's hierarchy of needs, right? We want to be able to contribute to something bigger than ourselves. And um, and we carry that with us, whether it's conscious or unconscious. Thirdly, we want to be seen and known. We want to be seen and known, have someone know our name, have a place that we can go. My sister often says, She calls work the sanctity of work because she has somewhere to go on any given day, you know, Um, and I think I think we want that her people that she works with know her. They know her name. They know her story. They can talk with her a little bit about that. And and it feels good. Um, Closely related is the fourth, which is to connect in real ways with other people. And Eric, this is one of the things that I think has also changed. Um, Certainly, it's a movement away from one aspect of Maslow's hierarchy. You know, Maslow had sort of the need for social connection. He called it the need for love and belonging. And he had it kind of midway up the pyramid. Um, But today, researchers such as Dr. Brene Brown, who's a mentor of mine, and others, Daniel Goleman, are saying that our need for human connection is as important as our need for food, shelter, safety, and security. So said another way, without social connection to other human beings, we die. Mm. So that's that shifts everything because if you go back to what we talked about earlier, if we're spending the majority of our time at work, we are carrying that need for connection to other human beings at very human need right into the workplace. And we know that loneliness is an epidemic. Um, men suffer disproportionately from it. The UK um, appointed in 2018 a new member of parliament called the Minister of Loneliness, whose single job is to reduce isolation, especially in the rural areas. So this this dynamic of our need to connect with others at work, I think, is is really essential. And then the last three are to learn, which is to become better. That's also on Maslow's hierarchy, right? I want to grow whether I'm at the front line or I'm a CEO. I want to be better tomorrow than I was yesterday. We want to feel supported, which is the sixth, which I define as being able to be brave, knowing that there are risks. And that item has to do with the title of the book, of course. And I started out the research calling that to feel safe, And I was basing it on my own experience as a consultant, but also research such as Google's Aristotle Project, which defined the key element to team health being the presence of psychological safety. 
And then I started, as I dug in and researched, I realized, you know, we can't guarantee safety at work or at home. We can't guarantee you won't be fired. We can't guarantee that, you know, you might have a really hard conversation at work. So I'm reframing it around, yeah, we know we can't guarantee safety, but we can commit to support so that people can be brave, even even when we know there are risks. And then the last one, which is increasingly important, I see this in my own children who are millennials and Generation Z, is to make our lives work, which is to be able to do the things that matter to us and are ours to do, which is really different. You know, you might be um, someone who likes to take afternoons to volunteer and I might have young children. And so how do I integrate my work into my life? Uh, and that's, I know you talk a lot about that on your podcast as well. And that's a big driver for, uh, for people at work today. So those seven things then, when they're present, we find that the workplace is great for people. When they're not present, we see dimensions of toxicity rear their ugly heads. So what makes a workplace toxic, at least these days, it's the vacuum of these. It's, it's these not being present. Like we need all of these, all of them in healthy yeah. amounts, not just one, two, three of them, even, even two, three, four of them. Like it's still going to feel potentially toxic if you're missing the others. Yes, I think that's really true. And one of the things that Cam and I discovered in our initial research was that these needs do change over time. Um, you know, they're, they're temporarily relative where, and to me, it's an interesting sort of complex algorithm that varies based on our stage of life. And, um, I was thinking about my son who is, uh, 26 and he, one of his needs right now that's quite high is making his life work because he's got a passion for community-based, uh, song leading. And he's involved in creating a network around the country of people who do this work and it's not very lucrative. So his work for money primarily feeds this um, passion that he has to contribute to the world in this way. And there may come a time, you know, he's a single guy. He doesn't have family right now. There may come a time where he thinks, oh, actually, you know, I need to have my basic needs elevate in priority. Um, I had another client who is closer to retirement and was talking about really wanting to focus more on what she has still yet to learn as she sort of ends her career. And so that learn priority is more important to her than, than getting her needs met or even being seen because she's accomplished a lot of that already. So I think that, you know, it's an interesting idea to think about, whoa, so this algorithm is different for every human being, which of course, leaders that I consult with look at me with cross eyes sometimes because they go, oh, great, Mo. So now we not only have to know that these seven things matter, but we have to treat each human like they're uniquely different. And how am I supposed to run a business this way? Um, (laughs) To which I say, yeah, well, the best you can do is to create the conditions by which the majority of those needs can generally be met by employees should they should they seek to have them met and hope that that, that will work. Um, what I find ironic about the concern is that one of the main contributors to those seven things not happening in the workplace for humans is that th- that company or that organization keeps leaders on station who are bad for people. So leaders have a huge role in creating those conditions. And, you know, we let's face it, Eric, right? We know our company through our immediate boss. So that's where I feel like um, organizations have a huge opportunity to invest differently and more strongly in how do frontline leaders and leaders in the middle of organizations connect and create these seven conditions for employees um, as opposed to the C-suite who, you know, you might have the best CEO in the universe, but if you work five levels down for Jack, who doesn't see you, doesn't know your name, doesn't connect the dots around why your job matters, and also never gives you the time off that you're due, you don't care how great that CEO is. Because the person right in front of you is right. telling, is you're, basically telling you otherwise. Exactly. You're stuck with Jack. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, you, you know, um, you know, the company through, through that person. So there, so that puts, I think a lot of responsibility on leaders at every level to be paying attention to their pod, their cadre of workers. Um, and how are they doing on these seven things? Well, let's remember again, that the people in leadership, even the immediate person right in front of you or right above you is also a human and also right. has need for these or, you know, has has a vacuum that needs has these needs to be filled for them as well. Yes, yes, you're absolutely right. And and sometimes their needs, you know, trump 
the needs of the employees as well, right? Because if they're not, if they have a vacuum, as you said, and they're not getting one of their most essential needs met, it's going to be really hard for them to um, provide the leadership and the support for the employees who work with them. Let's go into the creating or the transforming of a workplace into a brave space by using what you call these uh, levers. Yeah, and I love that you said levers because I've had this big debate with my husband about is it levers or is it levers? Well, Uh, (laughs) (laughs) I like levers, though. I like levers. Yeah, so what I try to do with regard to to getting right at that question you're saying, which is, all right, so if we know people need these things from work, you know, how is it we get there? And I, I turned to, you know, my past 30 plus years of consulting to organizations on issues of leadership culture and team health to say, all right, we know what it takes. And we do. I mean, we have so much research and evidence that says these are the things that work to create a workplace fit for human life. And I decided to put them into a model that sort of goes back to my days as a uh, reporter at when I was in university, which is, I call them the the who, what, where, uh, why and how. And the who is the first lever, um, which I define as the human essentials. And it's the one that we're probably talking about the most in what we've covered so far. It has sort of two, I call them two acts, two main parts. The first one is leaders with head and heart habits. And the second is teams who care. And you'll notice a thread between those two dimensions, which is um, creating more capacity in the human essentials for connectivity, connection, emotional intelligence, social intelligence, and um, and really um, emotional fluency. And again, you know, these are dimensions of um, of organizational effectiveness that only really in the last twenty years do we have the strong research that says, oh, these things matter. It's not enough to just be a good analyst, to make good, brave decisions, um, and to be able to crunch data. Uh, we need to, we need to actually create the conditions around which people thrive. And a lot of this is in, in the emotional realm. Um, so that's the first one. Um, we'll come back to that one. Cause I think that's the most important yeah. one in a lot of ways. If you don't have the, the human essentials, you're, you're going to really struggle. Um, to create a brave space workplace. But the other four, just so we don't forget them, the second one, the what is a conscious culture. And when I talk about culture there, I'm really referring simply to how we do things here. And um, every organization, whether it's two people or 200,000 people has a culture, it's born of the founders and devolves from there. Oftentimes, it's unexamined and underutilized as a key dimension of of organizational health. Um, The third lever is the where or the when, which I define as purposeful design. And oftentimes, when people see that language, they assume that I'm talking about the workspace itself. And there's a piece of that, right? We need to have you know, ergonomics be considered. We want to have the right physical space for people to work. But I'm talking about other uh, other things as well there, such as how does performance get managed and discussed? What are the processes that exist between us? You know, so many employees and employers right now have remote workers. So how do we design our interactions across distance um, so that we retain those connections. So really anything that can be designed, I put in that category as, as purposeful design. The fourth lever is meaning and context or the why. Having organizations where people can grab onto and understand why does this matter? Why do I matter? What's the context around which this organization exists? That's, of course, really important to consumer um, or customer engagement as well, because we know that that matters um, to the the broader um, you know economic system around how customers connect to our organizations. And then the last one, the fifth lever, is the how, which I call just the soft stuff and being real. And it's in that arena that I t- tuck back in a little bit to the human essentials, but also get at some other things like inclusion and diversity and how they play out in organizational health and in workplaces that are fit for human life. We've got to tend to um, to the kinds of balance we have um, in, in our sort of human uh, diversity and inclusion. I was kind of taking a mental uh, inventory of mm. each one of those five uh, levers and 
connecting it, almost drawing an imaginary line in my head to uh, the seven things that we had mentioned earlier and, you know, wh- which addresses those, although they all kind of address all of them. So I guess that's kind of pointless. <laughs> that's kind of what I was realizing. I was like, I'm drawing a pic, I'm drawing a line from one, each one of these in my head to each of the seven things earlier. Mm-hmm. Um, but again, it, it for me, it, it just still continues to come down to one, an awareness of the needs beyond just the original first one, which was having the monetary need met. But then moving beyond that to meet these other needs, having intentionality along with that awareness to create a culture, have purposeful design and to to imbue the workspace into, well, to transform the workspace into a brave place uh, or brave space, I should say. I'm mixing my words now. I know. No, I know. It gets confusing. <laughs> yes. Uh, w- when the words brave space and workplace uh, go hand in hand in the title, it's easy to swap them. So Yes. <laughs> but yeah, I just keep seeing this more, I guess I'll use the word holistic, where, mm-hmm. you know, it, it's touching on these these things maybe we weren't really realizing uh, should be part of the everyday. I mean, if you think, I mean, I guess actually, if you think about it, it's almost like saying, you know what, I'm an, I'm an artisan, you know, that word's loaded these days with like, mm-hmm. you know, it's, it's a gluten-free artisan role that comes with da 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 da. you know, but, uh, <laughs> but an artisan truly is someone who's actually, you know, is giving back and getting something also at the same time out of the work that they're doing. Yeah. That I love the word artisan actually, and I think it speaks to a hunger that we have in society right now in general, which is that we hunger for things that are real, things that are unique. You know, um, my husband and I have a new home here. It's just um, we've just lived here two years, and it's a different part of town than we live we've lived in in the past, and we've been. Um, furnishing it together as a second marriage. So it's sort of new, you know, for us to do that. And we were looking at some art recently and, um, the, one of the pieces of art we were looking at was actually just, uh, you know, an inexpensive, uh, piece that was like a pier one or something. And, and, and we both thought it was pretty. And I was like, Oh yeah, that looked kind of cool in this one space. And then, then we started looking at it more closely and we, we sort of decided and agreed, you know, but that's not actually an original piece of art. Like that's just, that's not done by anyone we know. Like that art has no connection to who we are. It's just pretty. It doesn't, it doesn't feel uh, like it's got any sort of art, 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 artisan oriented, you know, feeling. And I think that's, and so we didn't get it. And we're looking for something that has more significance to kind of our unique um, scene and our unique home and is maybe created by an actual human who we know. And I think that there is a craving for those kind of authentic, real things in society, you know, in general right now, rather than kind of the, the manufactured. And that's where the digital age also has, um, has helped us, I think, as a society is that we can, we can look behind the curtain in organizations in, in ways we never have been able to before. So companies of all types are called to be authentic. Otherwise, someone's going to tell the story about it on social media, and they're going to have to just, you know, do a recall or own, you know, what they did that wasn't really ethical. And so there's a, a cool sort of common good dynamic that can come out of, of the digital age. There's a, There's another piece, Eric, that that I want to mention that there's a, there's some really new, there's some really good new research that is pointing to what you're saying. And, um, two things that I mentioned, two dimensions of that, that I mentioned in the book, one is that Deloitte did a really powerful, uh, report and based on uh, some of their research, Deloitte, the big consulting company about the future of work. And they, they do a really nice job sort of tying the future of work to, um, the role that work plays in society at large um, for solving our big social and global issues. And I think that that's, that's an interesting call out and an interesting observation about how it is that people align themselves with organizations. Again, going back to that meaning, since we're not just working for a paycheck so much anymore, we're, we're a, we, we want to, to be able to connect to that bigger role that our employer or our workplace, you know, adds to society. The other trend that is powerful is that our definition of what a good leader looks like has changed, Mm. you know, irrevocably. Um, I maintain that, you know, our, our, our historical notions of leadership are based on kind of the overseer mentality of the industrial revolution. Like, 
you know, I've got 500 sewing machines in my woolen mill and it's my job to keep the people in line. So the people are treated more like machines, um, you know, produce this output, don't go off the line. And that, that worked for us for a hundred years. And now the overseer minds, it doesn't work for us as leaders anymore. There's a great study that was done by John Grzyma and Michael D'Antonio in their book called The Athena Doctrine, in which they studied, they interviewed two different sets of people, 10,000 respondents in each set. And they were looking at two things. One was which characteristics of leadership do you think are critical for the next 50 years globally? And the second is which of these characteristics of leadership do you define as masculine or feminine? And what they discovered is that the characteristics that were seen by these global leaders as the most important to health of businesses and organizations for the future were predominantly those that were defined as feminine. So qualities like empathy, patience, compassion, and collaboration were seen as critical for organizational health tomorrow, as opposed to what I think has historically been valued which sort of goes back to this overseer mentality, which is compliance, risk-taking, analysis, and logic. And so we're seeing a real sea change around what does it mean to be an effective leader, and we're seeing a a, a re-emphasis and a strengthening of characteristics that I think historically we've kind of kept out of work. We've kind of done a great overview, but there's so much more that the employee, the employer – And even the, I'll say, the remote worker or the person who works for themselves at home could do to, because even they should be creating, you know, whether they're they're a small team of one or they're a small team of one, two, three, four, five, or however many, Mm -hmm. uh, even small businesses, this affects deeply. And so uh, I would love for people to go and take a look at this. Again, it's called Brave Space Workplace. And uh, is there anywhere that you'd particularly like to send people or let people know they can go, uh, you know, check out the book a little bit deeper before they decide to pick it up? Oh, absolutely. Thank you so much for that. And and I love I love your invitation to folks. We have um, a downloadable free chapter on my website, which is um, I think it's available both at Mo. It is available both at MoCarrick.com. So my first name is Mo, M-O-E, and then the last name C-A-R-R-I-C-K. And then the chapter is also available on the book's website, which is BraveSpaceWorkplace.com. And the book is available also um, at all the usual places that all the indie outlets, um, Amazon, Bar- Barnes and Noble, et cetera, or you could buy it from uh, from my link to my website. And I would love to engage with people via LinkedIn, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram around their own experience with a brave space workplace. I consider myself still an ongoing student around what are the, you know, what is this complex alchemy that helps us really love coming to work every day. And so I'm I'm eager to uh, to hear from people. What do they think of the book? What do they think of their own workplace? What do they want? What do they need? And and to help me continue to sort of push on, on those aspects for employers globally. Awesome. Mo, it's been great talking with you. And, you know, we missed the first book. This is the second book. We kind of tied up both the first and the second into this one a little bit, but open invitation for the next one. So... Awesome. Thank you so much, Eric. What fun talking to you. We could go on all day. Yes. Thank you, Mo, for being here. Thanks for having me. Well, that's another podcast episode crossed off your podcast listening to-do list. I hope that you enjoyed this episode with Mo Carrick. I hope that you thought about making your workplace, whatever shape that takes, into a brave space workplace. If you enjoyed this episode, I'd love for you to share it either on social media or by thinking of that one person that you know needs to hear this conversation that you just heard and sharing it with them. Open up your podcast listening app of choice, hit that share button, let that person know, and don't forget to visit the show notes for this episode, which you can find at beyondthetodolist.com slash 285 And make sure to subscribe so you don't miss a future episode coming up. I've got lots of great conversations scheduled and some really great and even some really huge guests coming down the pipeline in the remainder of this calendar year. So again, thanks again for listening, and I'll see you next episode. 